I am Murish Oriada, the Global Brand Director for Hendrix Gin. Um, and it is part, for those who aren't familiar, it's part of the William Grant & Sons family, which is a privately owned fifth generation uh, company of distillers. Um, so, yeah, when I was thinking of coming over for today and standing up in front of, you know, world's best bartenders and bar owners, I find it quite odd, um, but also an honor. So an oddity in the sense of it being quite appropriate for Hendrix, but for me, I'm personally fourth generation in the drinks industry. Uh, my grandmother inherited a bar. My mother was raised in that bar, but I have never actually worked in a bar, so it's strange to talking to bartenders. Um, the other reason is um, normally for these kind of events, for a BCB gig, it would be for one of our ambassadors to talk about, um, like Jacob was talking about. So either Ali, our global brand ambassador, Tim from our distillery, or Coco here in Germany. and. I will try and do some justice to what they can do uh, at an incredible value. But at the same time, like I said, I find it an honor. Um, so for us on Hendrix, the bartending community is and always has been critical to our success. So for us on, and for me on Hendrix, being responsible for such a prestigious brand, I'm very conscious of, of three golden rules that I've set for myself. One is to respect the distiller. The second is to respect the liquid. And the third is to respect the bartender. And I know if I stay true to those rules, I can't go wrong in finding great stories to tell from Hendrix that retain all the unusual brand magic that it's known for as we scale up the brand. And for those who are less familiar with Hendrix, the seeds of it start back in 1966. And so much of Hendrix is about serendipity and finding the tales to tell from it. And it was back in 1966 that the fourth generation of the, of the family, uh, Charles Gordon, went to an auction and bought two stills, two very, very rare stills. One was a Bennett still there on the left, and the other in the middle is the Carterhead still, an exceedingly rare still from 1948, the first one on the left from 1860, but both very, very rare stills. And at the time, he had absolutely no idea what to do with them, but he felt compelled to buy them at an auction. And it was actually 33 years later when he tasked a young Leslie Gracie now our wonderful master distiller, to create, as he put it, the quintessential English gin. And it was countless experiments later that became the infamous Hendrix gin, which is oddly infused with rose and cucumber. And its unusual origins in terms of those stills and the production methods are alive and well in how we activate the brand around the world. And it's that sense that comes from Leslie, from the family of that innate curiosity, the sense of experimentation, and just the creative spirit to experiment, to try new things, particularly when it comes to flavor ingredients, that is so critical for us in innovation. Um, because so much of what we've done is through the collaboration with or inspiration from the bartending community. So what I might do is share with you two examples. Now it stopped working. Uh, two, oh, there we go. Uh, two examples of how we've kept that spirit alive in the sense of innovation coming through on Hendrix. So um, the first one uh, goes back to 2013. And so much of what we do around innovation is things that are not necessarily making sense on the surface, where Leslie has felt compelled to do something, where we've aimed them squarely at the bartending community, and where um, often there's no commercial angle to them. And this first one goes back to 2013. And the time, as you do, Leslie felt compelled to go to the Venezuelan rainforest. And she wanted to go and explore it and find weird and unusual and odd uh, botanicals. So off she went for two weeks with the then brand ambassador at the time, David Piper. At great personal risk, we had a, an expert um, explorer with her called Charles Boer and an expert botanist in Francesco Delasio. And they went into, into the jungle. Um, and explored, and there was one particular botanical that really caught her senses, and it was known locally as scorpion tail. And from that, Leslie distilled just nine concentrate, uh, concentrated distillate of that liquid, and she managed to smuggle that back to Scotland in bottles of Pellegrino. Um, and rather than commercializing it, what we did was actually bottle it. And we called it Canaricuni, and we invited bartenders from all around the world come to various different intimate events and to sample it and to try it and to experiment with it. And again, on the surface, it doesn't quite make sense, not necessarily a commercial play in any way. Um, but at the time, there was an escalation in uh, competition in the gin category. And we wanted to find ways and vehicles to remind um, the bartender community of that sense of experimentation, the unusual nature of Hendrix. And this was absolutely perfect. And once this liquid was gone, it was gone. 
And for us, years later, it became the kernel of our mainstream innovation platform, from which we've had four very successful variants to date. So this is from the Cabinet of Curiosities from Leslie. Um, so we started off with our first one called Hendrix Midsummer Solstice. We then had um, Hendrix Amazonia, followed by Hendrix Lunar, and then this year we had Hendrix Neptunia. And all of them have taken great inspiration from that uh, original Kanarakuni, so they're all limited edition. Um, they're all playing to the unexpected, so yes, we're aware of trends, but hopefully for Hendrix we're setting a few along the way. They're all allowing us to tell great stories, and particularly for our bartending community as well, to do the same with theirs. Um, and lastly, they're a vehicle for, for Leslie and the, uh, the team to, to express that sense of, of curiosity, uh, which is critical for us. The second example then of keeping that sense of experimentation alive is our latest play um, of a bartender pure play with Absinthe. And Absinthe has its own sorry past in the sense, similar to gin, it, it, they're production cousins in many ways. There's a lot about it that's very, very similar. Um, it's a spirit that's known for painters, dreamers, and uh, poets, and those who've lived their lives beyond the bounds of convention. And what we wanted to do was take inspiration from that and create a gloriously accessible liquid. So traditionally, due to the strength of flavor and ABV, absinthe is often a supporting ingredient. So with this, we've aimed it squarely at the world's best bars and a way for them to express their experimentation, their curiosity as a lead ingredient for the brand. Um, in their cocktails. And very much for bartenders, so the global launch, for example, neither I nor anyone from my team, nobody from the commercial team, it was just an event for bartenders run by bartenders. Uh, and it had all the theatricality and eccentricity that you would expect of Hendrix from uh, cemeteries, priests, falling walls, banquets, and, and uh, absent fairies. And slowly but surely, we're now rolling this out across to the world's top 500 bars. Um, and for me, in terms of those two gold, uh, there were three golden rules, uh, is um, respecting the distiller, respecting the liquid, and respecting the bartender. There's no better embodiment of that than the gin palace, which is our distillery, but also our spiritual home. And that sense of the, um, the family company mindset and thinking in generations, thinking for the long term, it's alive and well here in that sense of investing accordingly. So those stills that Charles bought back in 1966, they're still there. They're still working day in, day out, producing Hendrix in the same way that Leslie and Charles created it way back in the day. And it is, um, it is a home for experimentation, so it's not open to the public. It's only where Leslie Gracie can be found. Um, so she is quite the beguiling character, a legend in the gin industry, so has won multiple Lifetime Achievement Awards in gin. She's a very, very charming person. And for anyone who is going over to the Gin Palace, we have lots of visitors coming regularly. Um, I'd, ad I'd advise you to bring one of two things if you really want to charm her. Either one, chocolate. So she absolutely adores chocolate. Every project we name we have has a chocolate bar associated with it. Um, but the other one is to bring an unusual botanical. Bring something from your locality that she can experiment with. That's what she absolutely loves to do. And as I mentioned, the Gin Palace isn't open to the public. It is a home for hosting creativity, for heroing our liquids, a very peculiar obsession on our part for all things cucumbers. This is uh, the place to be. Um, but also for bartender events. So we host a huge amount of bartenders there regularly. Um, this is Coco, who I believe on Saturday won uh, Bartender of the Year in Germany, which is fantastic. So Coco is a legend and has hosted many an experience at the Gin Palace for anyone who's been looking to come. Um, but yeah, it is a home for creativity. We have hothouses and greenhouses. We grow our own botanicals, our own um, Mediterranean and tropical plants in those uh, hothouses. And it's, it's a play pen, if you, li if you like, for, um, for Leslie and her team to create, to experiment, to try new and different things. And often that, that sense is, is there of experimentation and risk taking for no other reason than just to say, well, what if we dot, 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 um, because you just never know what doors it will open uh, for the brand. So yeah, hopefully you've seen loads of examples of um, respecting the distiller in Kanarakuni, respecting the liquid in, um, in Absinthe, and respecting the distiller, uh, the, the uh, bartender in the Gin Palace. Um, and it is, hopefully you've seen examples of that uh, 
unique and eccentric brand personality, the brand magic that is Hendrix is alive and well. And all of those things are ways to create value way beyond any conversation on price ever will. And for us on the brand, um, we're very ruthless in keeping to what makes the brand different. And that family company mindset, that backing is critical to that sense of permission that comes through. So for me, when I think of the topic of today's conversation of delivering value beyond price, for me, I'd summarize it on Hendrix as curiosity without compromise. So thank you very much.